Okay, thanks very much. I'm uh, the chair for your next session. My name's Sharon Lewin. I'm the director of the Doherty Institute in Melbourne, Australia, and we're changing focus from acute infections to chronic infections, uh, retroviruses, and from population-based eradication strategies to uh, intrahuman eradication strategies. And I'm going to start off with the first talk, and I'm going to speak about some recent work my lab's been doing on the natural variation in HIV transcription in HIV-infected individuals on antiretroviral therapy. And the idea here is that if we're going to find ways to either activate transcription or permanently silence it, uh, we need to much better understand the mechanisms that control basal transcription in people on treatment. So many of you, I hope, I see some familiar faces, came to Melbourne um, last year where we hosted the last GVN conference. And I just thought I would start with um, an update on really what was a very successful outcome from GVN, which I hope um, others might enjoy or replicate when you host a meeting in your own country. When we hosted um, GVN in Melbourne, we decided to have a strong focus on HTLV1, um, namely because we had Bob uh, visiting Australia, but also because HTLV1 is a really big issue in our Indigenous communities. And that uh, conference led to quite some quite significant advocacy that was led by GVN in partnership with some of our experts on HTLV1 in Australia a huge amount of press that got high visibility in Australia, including um, a very highly viewed uh, uh, report in CNN, a little bit inflammatory, I should add, but still a highly viewed report. And the outcome actually was that there was an announcement for a new HGLV1 task force, uh, $8 million uh, uh, to investigate HGLV1 in Indigenous Australians. So this is really what I would say a really spectacular outcome for a vastly neglected disease that's been in Australia for a very long time. So thank you, Bob, and thank you to uh, GVN. That was, uh, so I think for those of you hosting a meeting, and I've learned from this in my HIV role, try and think strategically about how you can leverage the meeting to benefit your own country. So I'm going to switch tack. I work primarily on HIV, and I think all of you will know in the room that we don't have a cure for HIV. When we put people on antiretroviral therapy, we get very rapid decline of virus in blood. And nearly all individuals' virus will, ma will remain undetectable, and pretty much in all individuals, as soon as you stop treatment, virus will rapidly rebound. And we know that HIV can persist on antiretroviral therapy, in multiple forms. We've known for a long time about latent infection, where the virus integrates into resting T cells and doesn't proceed to produce uh, virions if this happens in a long-lived cell, like naive or central memory T cell, you're stuck with the integrated virus for life. And we also now know that these latently infected C, um, T cells can also proliferate, another very key strategy for the virus to persist and a whole lot of interest now in clonal proliferation of latently infected T cells. And this is thought to be the major barrier to a cure. At the same time, we know that some, in some cells in people on treatment, primarily in tissue, there's residual virus production or what's now commonly referred to as the active reservoir. And this virus doesn't go on to infect new cells and for some reason, these cells don't die, as you would normally think would happen in productive infection. So we think of HIV uh, persisting or infecting cells in two forms, productive infection, where a cell would be DNA positive, RNA positive, express proteins, and usually die, and latent infection, where you'd be DNA positive, RNA negative in true latency, should have no protein expression, and the cells will survive. But I think what we've learned over the last few years is that it's not that straightforward of these two extreme forms of infection, and there's actually a spectrum of transcriptional activity on antiretroviral therapy. And my lab's been very interested in trying to understand why that happens and what are some of the drivers for variation in transcription. So several years ago, we did a clinical trial of a latency-reversing agent called disulfiram, 
and we, we published that uh, a couple of years ago in Lancet HIV. And when we did this study, we enrolled 30 participants on stable antiretroviral therapy, and we bled those participants on three occasions to measure their basal level of transcription, and we were measuring cell-associated unspliced HIV RNA. And what you can see on this uh, graph is that uh, there are three time points, B1, B2, B3. And first of all, that there is clearly measurable um, cell-associated unspliced HIV RNA in every individual. And that there seem to be some variation that the levels of cell-associated unspliced HIV RNA was higher on the third time point. So we thought a lot about, um, and there'd been no intervention by this stage. The third time point was the morning which participants came in prior to them receiving the disulfiram. So we looked at whether this was a technical issue. It wasn't because all time points were run on the same, uh, on the same uh, run. Uh, patients were uh, recruited at, both at two sites, Melbourne and San Francisco. There was no difference between the two sites. And then we looked at time, and we realised that um, the collection of blood for that third time point was much earlier in the day, um, at 8 a.m., Then that's because people had to come in, have blood taken, and then receive their intervention. So we began uh, thinking to ourselves, well, uh, could time have had, has, would time potentially affect um, HIV transcription? or particularly um, does HIV transcription in people on treatment have a circadian rhythm? And there are many, many other examples of um, infections uh, and uh, T cell uh, distribution which has a circadian rhythm. So for those of you that don't know much about circadian cycles, um, it's complex. And uh, this is the complex uh, feedback loop, but the real drivers of circadian rhythms are these two proteins clock and BMAL1, and they bind to an e-box to drive transcription. And what they do is they also regulate their own function by driving transcription of some repressor circadian proteins, um, primarily uh, PER and CRI genes. So with um, clock and BMAL1 will drive, will active, are called circadian activators, they'll drive transcription of these circadian repressors that will then repress production of clock and BMAL1. And this cycle is what continues throughout a 24-hour period and controls many, many, many of our genes. And I think many of you will know that in 2017, the Nobel Prize was awarded um, to the three leading scientists who discovered these pathways. So why would this be relevant to HIV transcription? Well, first of all, the HIV LTR has four EBOX binding sites, with two of them flanking the tartar binding site. Um, for those that are not familiar with EBOXs, they're palindromic uh, sequence motifs, which are for basic helix loop helix class of DNA binding proteins. Um, they're important for regulation of transcription of multiple retroviruses, including both HIV1 and HTLV1. Um, clock proteins also have intrinsic histone acetyl transferase activity and can mediate chromatin remodeling through histone acetylation, which is thought to regulate HIV transcription. And finally, several years ago, um, in, in, in individuals off ART, um, plasma RNA on its own has been reported to have circadian variation. So we thought this was a plausible um, hypothesis to explore. So we first measured the um, circadian genes in these same th participants where we had three basal baseline samples, no intervention, people on ART. So we measured the genes for clock and BMAL1, saw no variation. When we looked at the circadian repressors, now PER1, PER2 and PER3, there are three genes from that family, and CRI1 and CRI3, you can see that there is quite a bit of variation. So particularly PER1, which has increased levels at this third time point, um, CRI1 and PER2. The other um, potential explanation for what we were seeing was that people had an increased stress response on that third time point because they'd come into the clinic at 8am, were having blood taken, were about to receive this new drug. So we measured 
a few um, hormones, particularly cortisol, which also has a circadian rhythm, and that was elevated at the third time point, and thyroid stimulating hormone, which should respond to stress, also elevated at that third time point. And we measured T cell numbers, T cell subsets, activation markers, because we know T cells um, also have a circadian rhythm and um, histone acetylation, but actually showed, identified no real difference at these three baseline time points. Remembering there isn't a big time difference um, between the third and the first time points of about four hours. We put um, all of these parameters into a mathematical model and used linear regression to see which component had the biggest effect on cell-associated unspliced RNA. And we could clearly see an effect of time, although quite modest, with a pretty high p-value, but a very significant effect on visit, independent of time. So we went on to um, explore, to, to design two further studies, one to answer the issue of time and one to answer the issue of stress affecting transcription. We also did what's called a path analysis. This was complex, so what we did was we replaced the time of blood draw in the mixed effects model with the expression levels of the clock associated genes, because these genes are also regulated by time. And we found that female one was the only gene statistically significantly associated with cell associated unspliced RNA, RNA with a very high effect size. So we went on to explore how BMAL1 might be regulating HIV transcription. So first of all, we wanted to confirm that there were changes in unspliced RNA over time, and we established a new study. This was done at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with Leslie Cochran, and we enrolled 17 participants on stable antiretroviral therapy. They were admitted to hospital, and they were bled at regular uh, four-hour periods over a 24-hour cycle and there was strict control over light and their diet and what stimulants they were taking. And we measured all of the circadian genes and cell-associated RNA. We're just beginning to analyse this data now, but I'll show you an example of one participant. This shows you the circadian activator genes, so you can see clear cycling of BMAL1 over a 24-hour period and little change in clock. And the circadian repressor genes also showing cycling Unspliced RNA down the bottom showing clear cycling over the 24-hour period and really little um, variation in HIV DNA. And we're currently looking across the whole cohort developing a model to understand those cycles. We then went on to see what a clock and BMAL1 doing to transcription. And to answer these, um, uh, this we used HEC 293 T cells and co-transfected those T cells with a range of plasmids, one that contains an L LTR luciferase reporter, and then the clock and BMAL1 proteins, and then TAT as a positive control. And when we measured luciferase activity uh, relative to the um, vector LTR luciferase reporter alone, you can see that TAT clearly increases transcription, as you would expect. Clock and BMAL1, um, low but significant effects, but clearly an effect when you have both because they need to heterodimerize to then bind to the LTR. We looked at this in a separate model, this time using a JLAT cell line, which, is a sta which contains a stable integrated form of HIV with a GFP reporter, a model of latency. And again, when we stimulate the cells, you see increased GFP. When we, when we um, co-transfect TAT, increased EGFP, and then an increase um, lower than TAT, but a clear increase when you co-transfect CLOCK and BMAL1, and found similar changes with unspliced RNA. Now here's a schematic of where these E boxes sit. Um, you can see the four E boxes sitting within the LTR, E box one, two, three, and four. Different clades of virus have different numbers of E boxes, and the HXB3 um, clone does not have the E box 3. We then went on to mu mutate each of these E boxes to see where clock and BMAL1 may bind and measure its luciferase activity with relative to wild type. And you can see here when we mutated E box 2, we lost um, luciferase activity when we co transfected clock and BMAL1 telling us that CLOCK and BMAL1 were binding to E-box 2, 
and we did a range of muta mutants where, with and without the mutation in, e in EBOX2, and you can see EBOX2 was critical for the binding of those transcription factors. So in summary, we showed here there's clearly natural variation in cell-associated unspliced HIV RNA with a clear relationship to time and variation over a 24-hour period. Um, BMAL1 was the only circadian gene that was associated with cell-associated unspliced RNA. BMAL1 forms a heterodimer with clock and can activate HIV transcription through binding to that EBOX2. And we think that these pathways could be exploited to identify new latency reversing agents or potentially enhance the effect of these agents based on the time of administration, and we're currently exploring that now. Now, the other hypothesis was that stress was affecting HIV transcription because we had this very strong um, ex um, um, relationship to that third visit, that, which was earlier in the day, but on the day people were receiving their drug. So we um, again set up another prospective study. Um, this was done with um, collaborators at UCSF. And what we did here was we enrolled participants who were on stable antiretroviral therapy. They came in on what we called a control day and had blood taken at various time points. And they came in on a subsequent day, which was their stress day, where we administered something called the TRIA social stress test, bled um, the participants before the stress test, they underwent a series of stress tests and then bled after the recovery phase. And we enrolled 25 HIV infected individuals, had a high CD4 count on stable antiretroviral therapy. Now this is what a TRIA social stress test looks like. Um, apparently you come in and you stand in front of two very stony faced examiners and they give you tests for maths and speech and spelling and uh, does really stress you out because we, um, we measured a whole range of physiological evaluations. So we looked at heart rate vari We were working with some real experts in this area. This is out of my league. And um, we looked at heart rate variability, which is a mark of parasympathetic activity, um, impotence cardiography, which is sympathetic activity, and then also measured a whole lot of markers of the virus and T-cell subsets and activation markers. And so this is proof it really stresses you out. In the red line is the stress day, in the blue line is the control day. And this is salivary cortisol, um, which uh, you, we collected before the intervention um, over the time of the control or following, this is when you get your maths test, <laughs> your spelling test, and you're still stressed 30 minutes later. Um, so we clearly did, the, the intervention did what we planned to do. It did, it did raise cortisol levels significantly. It also lowered the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, a sign of, paras, of a lowered parasympathetic function and increased sympathetic function by reducing the, what's called a pre-ejection period and increasing cardiac output. So the intervention clearly did stress the participants. We looked then at what happened to cell-associated HIV RNA, and again, you can see this very significant increase which persisted after the stress test was complete, and we saw no change in the HIV DNA. We looked at changes in T-cell subsets um, or T-cell activation following the stress and saw no significant change. We looked at the fold change in unspliced HIV RNA relative to the pre-ejection period. So you can see this clear inverse relationship to sympathetic function. And then when we did a multivariate analysis, you can see no effect on DNA, but a clear effect on unspliced RNA for these two parameters, cardiac output and pre-ejection period, which are markers of sympathetic function. So what does all this mean? Well, I think it tells you that when we measure unspliced HIV RNA, particularly in clinical trials, there are lots of factors that modulate that expression, and I've shown you two of those, time and stress, and it needs to be considered in clinical trials, particularly of latency reversing agents, where this is often the primary endpoint. The circadian transcription factors, clock and BMAL1, clearly have a role in upregulating HIV LTR mediated transcription, and we're looking hard at multiple drugs now that alter the expression of these proteins. Um, circadian proteins and or stress represent pathways that could potentially be exploited for both latency activating or repressing interventions. 
And I think unspliced RNA may not be the best marker to use when um, assessing RNA transcription. It tells you um, initiation of transcription, and I think we should be looking further down um, the, uh, the pathway potentially to multiply spliced RNA as a better biomarker for latency reversal. So um, this work was uh, funded uh, by the National Institutes of Mental Health and the NIAID. It was really actually all um, largely done, the in vitro work was largely done by a PhD student all in his first year, um, Jared Stern. The clinical trials were done, um, the stress study at UCSF led by Rick Hecht and the um, uh, uh, circadian study done at the University of Wisconsin led by Leslie Cokerham and we also had funding from the Australian government, NHMRC, and I'll finish there. Thanks very much.